Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato Alahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami Okay, so welcome to the uh, Sutta class, the Word of the Buddha. And this, in case you uh, haven't been here before to this class, is a series of uh, extracts from the suttas, all put together in the form of the Four Noble Truths. And I keep going through this uh, again and again and again. This is basic teachings of the Buddha, but not just basic, just sometimes they're extremely powerful. And they give the essence of how the Buddha taught. And having gone through the first Three Noble Truths, we get to the Fourth Noble Truth, which is Right View, and we did, uh, uh, I think, three sessions on right view. Now we come to the, the finale of the right view section, which is talking about the Sotapanna, the stream winner. And so here we go, the Sotapanna, or stream enterer. It's on there, yes. When you contemplate in this way, three fetters are abandoned in you. And those three fetters are a view of a permanent essence, what most people call a soul, skeptical doubt, and belief that rites and rituals are sufficient in themselves to reach enlightenment. Those who have abandoned three fetters are all stream enterers, no longer subject to rebirth in a lower realm and headed for full enlightenment. Now straight away, those three fetters, the first of those fetters is the most important in my estimation, the view of a soul, a permanent essence. And anyway, in a few uh, minutes, we'll just get down to what is the view of a permanent essence, the Sakaya Ditti. And the skeptical doubt, even doubt itself is a very uh, profound, aspect of the mind, a mind which is free from doubt, is quite rare. And in fact, the, the mind which is free from doubt is basically, please excuse me again, is a mind which is free of the five hindrances. To experience a mind free of doubt, you do need to get some stillness in the mind, some deep meditation. And afterwards, whatever you experience, you can perceive it clearly without distorting the data to fit your views. It's like the truth which you experience changes your views, which is why you can only get this perfect view of a stream winner is when that doubt is no longer there. The clarity of the mind is so powerful that you see what is actually the way things are. You may have heard many people talking about the way things are but uh, to know the way things are, they have the cause for it, and that is uh, samadhi. Samadhi pachaya yata bhutayana dasana. It's the stillness. It's the cause for seeing things as they truly are. And that stillness does uh, refer to the sama samadhi, the deep stillnesses of the jhanas and afterwards. So this is where you see things as they truly are. And so skeptical doubt is gone. And also the belief that rites and rituals are sufficient in themselves to reach enlightenment. And though sometimes we do feel that even if we keep precepts, if we do some particular chanting again and over and over again, or if we do other such uh, harsh practices, Sometimes people still feel that that is enough. And if you keep doing that for long enough, you do get uh, to be enlightened. 
Rites and rituals can be useful, but it's more than just the rites and rituals, it's the letting go which allows you to let go deep enough to get stillness of mind and the stillness of the mind to give you that clarity to see things as they truly are. We'll be going into more detail on this in a moment. One of the nice things about the stream winner, those who have, who have abandoned three fetters are all stream enterers, no longer subject to rebirth in a lower realm. Why? Even if you've done some bad karma in the past, which will usually take you to a lower realm, you can't get there anymore. Why? And one of the reasons is, is because seeing no self, that there is no permanent essence, also allows you to see very, very clearly that there's no self, there's nothing which you own, no possessions, even the conduct of the past. You don't own it anymore, which means you're free from it making you get reborn in any lower realms. When you see uh, the truth of non-self, with that you abandon all sense of guilt. Sometimes you may have some remorse, I wish I hadn't done that, but the guilt and the punishment which goes along with that guilt, like sending yourself into a lower realm, is now gone. And for a long time I could Kind of, you could see this, but I couldn't find any reference in the suttas. I always thought that when a person dies, they're judged by some Yama god or something and sent to the lower realms if they've done something bad. But that was my wrong reading of the Pali. The job of any sort of spirit or Yama god uh, is just to make you remember. Well, what you do with that memory is totally up to you. No god will ever send you into a lower realm, a hell realm, or uh, a hungry ghost realm. Only you think you deserve to be there if you're not a stream winner. Once you're a stream winner, there's no way you will ever send yourself to a place like that. So that means that those lower realms are cut off from you forever. And you're headed for full enlightenment. Whether you like it or not, you're out of here. And they say that how many more lives have you got? If you're a stream winner and you pass away, you die. What's the maximum number of more lives which you have? So, some people said seven, some people said six. Which is the right one? Many of you heard me before, it is six, because this life is counted as one. The next life is two, the next life after that is three. So it's six more lives after you die, maximum. You know how it is in Asia, we always count where we are now. When a baby is born, they're one year old. And then the next year, the first birthday, that they're two. Anyway. Now just a little uh, praise of what it's like to be a stream winner. Absolute rule over the earth, absolute rule. Going to heaven, supreme sovereignty over all worlds, the fruit of stream winning surpasses them all. That's a very sort of high description from the Dhammapada of what it's like to break through and to realize you've entered the stream. Which is nice. First we said what it is, now what it's like, now how it's done. The causes for the arising of right view of stream, stream winning. Now in Sri Lanka, they call being a stream winner a soul one. And I don't know how many times that people in Sri Lanka come up and said, all I want is to be a soul one. How do you become a soul one? And it's a fair enough um, comment because once you're a soul one, you're basically out of here, six more lifetimes at most. 
So there are two conditions for the arising of the right view that is the word of another Aryan and this other thing called Yoniso Manasikara. And Yoniso Manasikara literally means uh, Manasikara is work of the mind, which goes back to the source, the Yoni. So, Yoni is like the womb where things come from, the cause of things. And this you will find throughout uh, the Buddha's teaching, not just saying like in the Satipatthana, now where does Rupa come from, uh, Rupa, it rises and passes away. That is not what actually the Buddha said. He said, why, what's the causes for say, like physical or body coming into being? What's the cause of it for it disappearing? In a Vedana, this experience or feeling some people say, not just watching it come and go, but why it comes, why it goes. Get to the causes of things. Suffering. The Buddha nev never just said about suffering, that was the first noble truth. But the second noble truth, the cause of suffering, working back to the source, why, where does it come from? And that's a, a classic theme of the Buddha's teaching called the Dhamma. Yeah, this is it. Why? Where did it come from? So this is uh, where we have the work of the mind which goes back to the source and the words of another Aryan, an Aryan being another stream winner, once return, non return, Arahat. And that's very, very important because that's one of the reasons why it is important to come and listen to teachings like this because they have a power. When I say brainwashing you, I really mean that. It conditions you, gives you another way of looking at things and then you follow that. It gives you the map and the work of the mind which goes back to the source. Use the power of your mind as a flashlight. Those two together can actually, you can find the treasure. And also, the Buddha said, the, there are five factors that build on right view and take it to full enlightenment. That's the virtue, the sila, the learning and the discussion. I like this one because it's not just learning about the Dhamma, but discussing it as well, having the opportunity to ask questions and get answers. That ability to question is again very, very crucial. You may have, you may have sort of uh, listened to so many teachings, but have you had the opportunity to ask those relevant questions? So if there's any misunderstanding or there's any kind of wrong view, you can question somebody and get decent answers. I always remember with an Ajahn Chah, you could always ask him questions even silly questions, but didn't matter, always to ask, answer questions. He wasn't just a great teacher, he was great to be able to answer your questions. And stillness and insight, I think you all know what stillness and insight is, that's samatha and vipassana. And not just one, but both. Now, that's almost like an intro to this today's session. What is the view of a permanent essence? This is the, the big problem. It's called Sakaya Ditti. And when we say Sakaya Ditti, just because we got that word, that part of that word is a compound word, Sakaya, people often think that Kaya means just body. And believe it or not, there are some people over in Thailand, Buddhists, some even monks, and they take that to mean that Sakaya Ditti is the view that somehow that you are part of the body or belong to the body, your sense of self is you know, taken up with the body. And as soon as you see that the body is impermanent, doesn't carry on, you think, oh, that's a stream winner. And that is one of the problems where a person doesn't really look at the suttas close enough 
and they get their own interpretations of these words. Of course, that's nothing to do with the view of a permanent essence. This is how the Buddha described what this view is. Friend Visaka, one who is an Aryan, that's a stream winner or above, cannot regard the body or Vedana, what I usually call experience, perception, will, or consciousnesses, being the five components of existence, you can't regard any of these as a permanent essence. Nor a permanent essence as possessing any of these five components of existence. Nor any of the five components of existence as within a permanent essence, nor a permanent essence as within any of the five components of existence. That is how Sakaya Ditti comes not to be. And I always uh, usually emphasize on that statement, or consciousnesses, because this is how the Buddha taught. There are six consciousnesses. And if you regard any one of these as a permanent essence, or as a permanent essence possessing any of the six uh, types of consciousness, or per like, like the, uh, the mind, if you think that the permanent essence possesses a mind, or is the same as the mind, or that the mind is within a permanent essence, or a permanent essence is within the mind, that is a not true. Now we have an explanation here from the Patisambhida Magga. The Patisambhida Magga, it is part of the Sutta Pitaka, part of the Kudaka Nikaya, and it seems to be one of the last parts of that uh, Sutta Pitaka. One who is an Aryan, a stream winner or more, does not regard the mind as a permanent essence, like the frame and hue of a lamp. The frame and the hue are just uh, no, different aspects, but it doesn't regard the mind as the permanent essence of the soul. Does not regard the mind as possessing a permanent essence, like a tree possesses a shadow, does not regard the mind as within a permanent essence, like the scent is within a flower, and does not regard a permanent essence as within the mind, like a jewel in some sort of casket. So the mind is part of the five components of existence, the six, six types of consciousness, that is sort of emphasized in the Pati Sambhida Manga. Now, any questions about that? If not, we can carry on, and if a question comes back afterwards, you're most welcome to ask it. Now, one of the causes for the arising of right view, the stream winner, is uh, the words of another mean from one who has seen through personality view, an Aryan. Now the words of another, I've seen in some Westerner who wanted to try and find some connection between Buddhism and Christianity, said the word of another, Paratogosa, meant the word of God, or the sweet voice of Jesus, or something like that. And it's crazy just how people can make something which is just one, um, phrase and interpret it in all sorts of you know, ridiculous ways. What the words of a, another mean is from one who has seen through the personality view. And this is a cause and effect relationship here which makes it very clear. One who is shameless, reckless and heedless will be unable to abandon disrespect, being difficult to admonish and keeping bad company. 
one who is disrespectful, incorrigible, and keeps bad company, will be unable to abandon lack of faith, stinginess, and laziness. One who is lacking in faith, uncharitable, and lazy, will be unable to abandon restlessness, lack of restraint, and immorality. See, three things lead to the next three things, which lead to the next three things. One who is restless, unrestrained, and immoral will be unable to abandon their fault-finding mind, disinterest in seeing Aryans and hearing their teachings. That's a lot of times why people won't come to the temple, have fault-finding minds. Why do you want to go and see that lazy fat monk for? They're finding fault. And sometimes that fi finding fault is just getting a bit over the top. One who is not interested in meeting with Aryans does not hear their teachings, hear the teachings of an Aryan, but has a fault-finding mind, will be unable to establish mindfulness and understanding of the purpose. They will be distracted. One who is without mindfulness and understanding with a wandering mind will be unable to abandon useless trains of thought following a wrong path and mental sluggishness. One who wastes time on useless thinking, on following a wrong path leading to a dull mind, will be unable to abandon the view of a permanent essence, skeptical doubt, and believe in rites and rituals, the first three of the five fetters. And one who has not abandoned the first three of the five basic fetters will be unable to abandon the desire for the world of the five senses, aversion and delusion, those called the three poisons. One who has not abandoned the three poisons, Kilesa, will not be able to abandon birth, aging, and death. And you see, I um, put in bold characters. Uh, does not hear the teachings of an Aryan. That is why hearing the teachings of an Aryan me is important for the whole path of understanding the Dhamma and becoming a stream winner and fully enlightened. The Drex simile is one of my favorites because when we have the idea of a stream winner, sometimes it means that uh, it's a, a bit too, uh, I wouldn't say intellectual, but it doesn't really ground it in the reality of the experience which you have in the world. This seven in the water simile does. That's one of the reasons why I really like this simile. And apparently it was one of the favorite similes of the, the late king of Thailand, King Rama the Ninth. Stream winning and the seven in the water simile. There are these seven kinds of persons similar to those in the water. I used to call this like people who are shipwrecked, which is probably the obvious reason why they'd be in the water for the first place. One who goes under and drowns, you know, almost drowns immediately. They are one with bad qualities. Number two, one who floats and then drowns, meaning good at first, but then develops bad qualities. Number three, one who floats and keeps their head above water, meaning the good qualities in them become even stronger. Four, this is a development of the third one who managed to keep their head above water because of the good sealer. The above who looks around and sees safety, meaning the stream enterer. This is one who's floating in the water, having been shipwrecked, and they look around and they say, there's dry land over there. That's the stream enterer. And if that was you, what would you do if you saw dry land? Doesn't matter how tired you were, <laughs> you'd go swimming towards the dry land. And so the above who is swimming to safety, meaning the once returner, and we only get reborn once into this world. And the above, who feels solid earth underfoot. They're so close 
to dry land. They don't need to swim anymore. They can wade the last distance to land. And lastly, the, the above who is safe on dry land, meaning the arahat. So that's a nice simile uh, said by the Buddha, the seven in the water simile. And that's when one is a stream winner. Now, this next one, I, uh, the Jan Anagami. This was something which, when I read it, it kind of uh, surprised me, not really shocked me, but just, yeah, I can understand this. Just as when the sky is clear and cloudless, the sun ascending in the sky depels all darkness as it shines and radiates. So too, with the dust-free, stainless dhamma eye arises in you. Then together with the arising of vision, you abandon three fetters, the view of a permanent essence, doubt, and a wrong grasp of behavior and observances. Afterwards, when you restrain two states, wanting and aversion, then totally secluded from the five senses, secluded from the five hindrances, you enter and dwell for a while in the first jhana, which consists of rapture and pleasure born of freedom from the five senses. That's what one is focusing on, what it consists of. The bliss, the rapture and pleasure born of being free from the five senses. And as you can't hear anything, you can't see anything, even if you had your eyes open, you can't smell, taste, or the physical body. You can't feel any touches anymore. And you can see it's a rapture and pleasure born of that freedom from the five senses, accompanied by movements of the mind onto the bliss and holding the bliss. If you should pass away while in jhana, there is no fetter bound by which you would ever return to this world. You get reborn. Just, well not reborn, you just exist in what we call the jhana realms. And when they fade away, so do you. You're gone. That's where the Paranivana takes place, never returning to this world anymore. If you're in a jhana, pass away. As well as that, they also have a similar teaching of the Buddha, where if you've done lots of jhana, and you're a, a, um, a stream winner already, and you practice jhana a lot, even that you're passing away, you can enter one of those jhana realms. And because you are already a stream winner, you never come back anywhere. You have that jhana realm which is pretty blissful. And when that fades away, so do you. That's why they call it an anagami, no return. It's almost, if there ever was a shortcut to Nibbana, that is it. You're only an, a, a stream winner, but nevertheless, the stream winner plus the jhana means you are a non-returner anagami. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> now, if you are an anagami in this realm, what would it be like? Because there was a monk called Kemaka he was an Aryan, very good um, meditator and understander of the Dhamma, but he was a non-returner, hadn't finally got to being an Arahat. Why? Friend Kamaka, they asked it, these are monks asking him. Friend Kamaka, when you speak of this I am, what is it that you speak of as I am? He replied, friends, I do not speak of form or like body as I am, 
nor do I speak of I am as apart from form. I do not speak of experience as I am, nor of perception as I am, nor of will as I am, nor of consciousnesses as I am, nor do I speak of I am apart from consciousnesses. Again, the five candles. Friends, although the thought I am has not yet, yet vanished in me in relation to these five components of existence, Still, I do not regard anything among them as this I am. And he explains further. Suppose, friends, there is the scent of a lotus. Would you be speaking rightly if you were to say the scent belongs to the petals, or the scent belongs to the stalk, or the scent belongs to the pistols? And how, friend, should you answer if you were to answer rightly? You should say, answer, the scent belongs to the flower. So too, friend, I do not speak of form as I am, nor do I speak of I am apart from form, nor do I speak of experience, of perception, of will, of consciousnesses as I am, nor do I speak of I am as apart from consciousnesses. Friend, although the thought I am has not yet vanished in me in relation to these five components of existence, still I do not regard anything among them as this I am. Friends, even though a noble disciple has abandoned the five basic fetters, still in relation to the five components of existence, there lingers in them a residual thought I am a desire I am, an underlying tendency I am that has not yet been uprooted. It's a residual thought. Sometime later, they dwell contemplating dependency on causes of the five components of existence, such as form, its origin, its passing away, such as experience, such as perception, such as will, such are consciousnesses, such as their origin, such as their passing away. As they dwell contemplating the dependency on causes of the five components of existence, the residual residual thought I am, the desire I am, the underlying tendency I am that has not yet been uprooted, this comes to be uprooted. And now the simile to make this even clearer. Suppose you washed a cloth in a washing machine. Now you see straight away this is not a literal translation of what's in the suttas. They did not have washing machines in the time of the Buddha. They say, suppose that somebody washed a cloth uh, in, I think, cow dung, which is what they used to do in those days. Now, when I, if I had translated it literally, then you think, <laughs> you get distracted by the uh, the uniqueness of that form of washing. So I just changed the simile and kept the meaning. Suppose you washed a cloth in a washing machine, rinsed and spun it, and then put it in a dryer. Although that cloth would be clean, still it might retain the residual smell of the soap powder then you would hang it out in the sun to air, and after a while, the residual smell of the soap powder would vanish. So too, friends, even though a noble disciple has abandoned the five lower fetters, still in relation to the five components of existence, there lingers in them a a residual thought, I am, a desire, I am, an underlying tendency, I am, that has not yet been uprooted. As you dwell contemplating dependency on causes of the five components of existence, the residual thought I am, the desire I am, the underlying tendency I am that had not yet been uprooted, this comes to be uprooted. Any questions? on this so far. One thing which I 
didn't add here, was you can see that Kamaka free from the thought, I am. There are what the Buddha called the three whippalasas, the distortion of the cognitive process, views, condition, um, perceptions, and perceptions condition thoughts, and then thoughts come back to condition your views. If you have a wrong view, that uh, perverts, distorts your perceptions. You only see what you want to see. You cannot see what is uh, abhorrent to you, challenging to you. And then from the perceptions, from those, you have your thoughts. And the thoughts reinforce the views. And you can see from here, the first thing which is abandoned or is straightened out is one's views. Once the views have been straightened out, you have right view. It does take a while to get right perceptions. This is not the best simile, but I know many people when they used to smoke cigarettes, they knew cigarettes were bad for their health. They had no doubt about that. They had the wisdom, the right view that cigarettes were bad for their health, but they can still, their perceptions were a little bit bent. It took them a while before they could give up smoking. People might realize that there's no permanent essence inside. They've seen that, they know that, but it takes a while for that view to start changing their perceptions and the perception to change their thoughts. For the right view to percolate through the other cognitive processes so that they don't just have right view, they have right perception and right thought. Is the thought which is straightened up last of all. That's the three whippalasas. Now, any questions or should I carry on? Yeah, go on, quick one, Eddie. Yes. 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 They're part of the 31 realms of existence. We need to have the, the realms which are based on the, uh, the jhanas. But once one is in one of those realms, uh, one cannot visit another realm. So in some heavenly realms, even in the Anagama realm, it's okay. You're asking how does those jhana realms compare to the, to the 31 realms of existence? Those jhana realms, I forget exactly now, I think it's 12 of those 31 planes of existence are the jhana realms. And that is where it is a, just a, uh, a one kanda existence. Just, is that true? Yeah, I think, well, just the mind, there's no body there at all. My four kanda existence, they would say, so yeah. Four kanda, but there's no physical body there in those jhana realms which is one of the reasons where they can last a very, very, very long time. And it's one of the reasons why at the end of the universe, you know, it's not just a big crunch, but just, you know, when this whole universe just runs out of energy, you know, or just it gets all dispersed and so nothing can really exist in it. Where do all human beings go? Where can they get reborn? That's where they say they mostly get reborn in the second jhana realms. There's no other place for them. And there they live until the next eon starts. So those are referring to the states which you know, they, they call the generals. And the point is that you know, if you are an, a stream winner and you go to one of those generals, that's it. You never come back anywhere else. No, it's not part of the Karma Loka. The jhana realms are apart from the Karma Loka. The word Karma in this sense means five senses. So you haven't got five senses anymore, you've just got the sixth sense. That's why it's pretty blissful. 
Okay. You got one here, Sil? I got some more running to do, Bill. No, it's okay. <laughs> oh, this one first of all. Yes. Um, the word of Arya uh, is uh, like some person who is so one or just uh, listening to Buddha Dhamma from any person? Okay. You do, do need more than just listening to the Dhamma. One of the difficulties with um, assessing what actually is a stream winner and what is somebody on the path of being a stream winner is often they make no distinction between those two. A good example of that is uh, the story of you know, the last uh, months of the Buddha. You may remember that many people tried to assassinate the Buddha and that the, the king had arranged an assassin to go to the Buddha and chop off his head or attack him with a sword and then there were two other assassins to kill the first assassin, four to kill the two assassins, eight assassins to kill the four who killed the two who killed the one and sixteen assassins to kill the eight assassins and he thought that way that he would uh, cover the tracks of actually who killed who. And, you know, fair enough, that was an interesting story. But one thing which really kind of challenged me when I read that is the first assassin, he found the Buddha and was about to assassinate him, but the Buddha was just too kind. This you know, sweet old man just meditating with so much loving kindness. He could not attack him at all. And so because of that, he said, look, I came here to kill you. I just can't do this. I ask forgiveness. And the Buddha said, your forgiveness is accepted. And the Buddha gave him a very short Dharma teaching. And that assassin became a stream winner. And I hadn't done any mindfulness training. Virtue was pretty sus and no meditation, hardly knew any Dhamma except just what he heard in front of the Buddha. What do you mean being a, a stream winner? That's really stretching it a lot. And then the two came and the same thing happened. They were looking, where's the one? You know, and then the Buddha gave them the, the Dhamma. They asked forgiveness too, they were about to kill somebody. And then the same happened with the four, with the eight, with the six, and they all became stream winners. So if any of you want to become a stream winner, <laughs> That's the easy way to do it. Now, what was actually going on there? When you get inspired, deeply inspired, especially by a Buddha, then you know there's something very appealing there. And you get this faith, incredible faith. And that may be enough to make you on the path to being a stream winner. Sadhanusari, following the path of faith. And of course, if you are following the path of faith, it's not just you don't do anything. You know, you start, you can't help it but keeping precepts. It's common sense to make, keep the precepts. You will start to meditate, you can't help it, you will get wisdom. You're on the path. And the thing with when you're on the path to being a stream winner, you have to attain that stream winning, the fruit, before you die. And to emphasize the point, that Buddha even made this statement that even if the universe is about to end, the universe has to wait for you until you fulfill your attainment of stream winning before the universe can stop. That was just making, <laughs> making a very strong point, how, in, how essential this is. So if you are on the path of being a stream winner in this life, then you will be a stream winner before you die or at your death. So it is so certain that sometimes in party they would say that yes, you are a stream winner, even though you're not really, but it's inevitable. And the best simile I can give for that is when I used to watch movies and the, the gangster movies, they say, Bill, 
You stole money from us. You're dead. <laughs> this is only... <laughs> of course, you never steal. You're just such an honorable man. What it really means is that your death is certain. But the way they say, it, even in English, is like you're dead. You're a stream winner. You know, it's happened. Although it hasn't happened, but it's bound to happen. And that gives a lot of confusion between people. To be a real stream winner, it's work of the mind which goes back to the source, sees the causes and effects. The words of another Aryan. You need both of those. And so those are the ways. And in brief, what you really need to be a stream winner is the Eightfold Path. We had lots of discussions as monks, as, do you really need uh, jhanas to become a stream winner? Some people say, well, there's not really firm evidence in here of the suttas. We all think that's necessary. You do need the streaming of that sort of power to understand oneself. And to give the best simile, you've heard it so many times, I'll just say in brief, was the, the, um, the frog in the water. It needs to leave the water to understand what water is. You need to leave the rule of the five senses and things like will. See things actually vanishing, which you never expected could vanish. And then, it becomes quite obvious that what you took to be um, a permanent essence of self wasn't. Have I confused you again? No, it's very good, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Al had a question. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, in relation to the words of another, um, for example, if someone didn't have access to a Buddhist community and a teacher in person, would it be okay, uh, would it be counted as the words of another if they were listening online or if they were accessing teachers' um, teachings from the past that have been recorded who've passed away? Yes, that qualifies as words of another. Okay. They even mentioned that even the reading the suttas, that's the words of the Buddha. That's pretty powerful. But again, the problems with uh, reading suttas is you can't understand Pali, even if you studied it. Sometimes just the way it was used, being born in that community, you understand much more of it. Even like Sinhalese, there's many Sri Lankan speakers here. But would you understand Sinhalese it was as, as it maybe was spoken? by the King Dutagamani. Sometimes even language does change to get a full understanding of what it meant. You know, you would have to understand this people's culture 25 centuries earlier. That is why these are great suttas and they're inspiring, but it takes a while before you can understand you know, what their meaning is. That's why uh, it is the suitors can be useful. But, you know, these days I'm kind of bamboozled myself why many people read these suitors and get ten different ideas from them. So that's why it needs to be someone who is an Aryan, who can understand some of the importance of what these things actually say. Thank you. But if it's on the internet, no trouble. Okay, we go further, free from all speculative views. Somebody asked, then does the Buddha hold any speculative belief at all? What is speculation? It is uh, things which we can kind of have an idea about, but which you haven't had no experience of. Not like direct understanding. Speculative, speculative belief is something that the Buddha has put away. For the Buddha has seen this. Such is form, like body. Such is, is its disappearance. 
So such is its origin, such is its disappearance. And again, it's not just, you know, knowing that a form comes and goes, it's also why it comes and why it goes. Such is Vedana experience, such is origin, such is disappearance, such is perception, such perception's origin, such is the disappearance of perception, such is will, and it's the the rough but powerful translation of Sankara. Such is will, such is the origin of will. Where does it come from? Such is its disappearance. Such are the consciousnesses. Such are their origin. Where does consciousness come from? Why is there consciousness? Such is their disappearance. Therefore I say, said the Buddha, with the destruction fading away, cessation, giving up and relinquishing of all conceptual proliferations. That is the word papancha. We used to use that word a lot, conceptual proliferations. All philosophizing, all I-making, mind-making, and the underlying tendency to assuming a permanent essence. The Buddha is liberated through exhausting the fuel that drives rebirth. That's incredibly powerful. So powerful, I'm going to read it out again. <laughs> Therefore I say, with a destruction, not destruction of a self or a body or anything, of the destruction of the papancha, the conceptual proliferations, the destruction, the fading away, cessation, giving up and relinquishing of all conceptual proliferations, all philosophizing, all eye-making, mind-making, and the underlying tendency to assuming a permanent essence. The Buddha is liberated through exhausting the fuel that drives rebirth. Three characteristics. Whether Buddhas arise or not, there persist, persists that law, that stable Dhamma, that fixed course of the Dhamma. All phenomena that arise from a cause are impermanent. Suffering are not a permanent essence. A Buddha awakens to this and breaks through to it, and then explains it, teaches it, proclaims it, establishes it, discloses it, analyzes it, and elucidates it. And what is it that the wise in the world agree upon as not existing, or which I too say does not exist? Form that is permanent, stable, and eternal, not subject to change. This the wise in the world agree upon as not existing. And I too say that it does not exist. Experience that is permanent, stable and eternal, not subject to change. This the wise in the world agree upon as not existing. And I too say that it does not exist. Perception that is permanent, stable and eternal, not subject to change. This the wise in the world agree upon as not existing, and I too say that it does not exist. Will that is permanent, stable, and eternal, eternal, not subject to change, this the wise in the world agree upon as not existing, and I too say that it does not exist. Consciousness, any of the six, including mind, that is permanent, stable, and eternal, not subject to change, this the wise in the world agree upon as not existing. And I too say that it does not exist. It is impossible, saying the Buddha, and inconceivable that a person who is enlightened or on the path to enlightenment, an Aryan, could consider any phenomena that arises from a cause as permanent, as pleasurable, and as a soul. 
There is no such possibility. But it is possible that an unenlightened worldling might consider some phenomena, the rise and the cause, as permanent, as pleasurable, and as a soul. There is such a possibility. Therefore, any kind of form whatsoever, any kind of experience whatsoever, any kind of perception whatsoever, any kind of will whatsoever, any kind of consciousness whatsoever, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all form, experience, perception, will, consciousnesses should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not a permanent essence. Now this next saying is absolutely brilliant. This is from the Wisudi Magga. This is not the suttas, but it's so brilliant, I have to include it. Mere dukkha, mere suffering exists. No sufferer, sufferer is found. The deed is, but no doer of the deed is there. Nibbana is, but not a person who enters it. The path is, but no traveler on it is seen. I remember giving lots of talks about that because it's so inspiring. Nibbana, if you went to enter Nibbana, you've got to disappear first. Nibbana is, but not a person who enters it. If you want to walk the path, don't be a traveler. The path is, but no traveler on it is seen. You vanish, you disappear, and the more you disappear, the wider that path is. When you're actually walking that path, it's just incredibly narrow, you keep falling off. If you disappear, then that path is like a super highway, 108 meters wide, you can't miss it. Don't travel it. The deed is, but do you really do it? Suffering exists, but there is no sufferer, no being. In those who do not understand, say, form, as it really is, who do not know and see its origin and cessation, and the way leading to its cessation, that thing can enlighten one exists after death, or does not exist after death, or both exists and does not exist after death, or neither exists nor does, does not exist after death. It is those who do not see experience as it really is, who do not see perception as it really is, who do not know and see will as it really is, who do not know and see consciousnesses as they really are, who do not know and see their origin of consciousnesses, their cessation and a way leading to their cessation, that think an enlightened one exists after death or does not exist after death or both exist and does not exist after death or neither exists nor does not exist after death. But one who knows and sees form, experience, perception, will, consciousnesses as they really are, who knows and sees their origin, their cessation, and the way leading to their cessation, they do not think an enlightened one exists after death, or does not exist after death, or both exist and does not exist after death, or neither exists nor does not exist after death. They do not even think like that. Now, the next sutta, again, is another one of my favorites, because I love putting my favorites. This is my anthology, <laughs> and of course I put my favorites in it. This is a Yamaka sutta. Uh, the Yamaka was uh, someone who said, after death, the Buddha is annihilated. So, Sariputta asked Yamaka, do you regard the body, experience, perception, will, or consciousnesses as an enlightened one? No, Venerable, says Yamaka to Sariputta. Do you regard an enlightened one as within the body 
as within experience, as within perception, as within will, or as within consciousnesses, no venerable. Do you regard an enlightened one as separate from the body, as separate from experience, as separate from perception, as separate from will, as separate from consciousnesses, no venerable? Do you regard the body, experience, perception, will and consciousness is taken all together as an enlightened one? No venerable. Do you take an enlightened one as one who is without form, without experience, without perception, without will, without consciousnesses? You know, an enlightened one is unconscious. No venerable. But Yamaka, when an enlightened one is not apprehended by you as real and actual here in this very life, is it fitting for you to declare that an enlightened one is annihilated and perishes with the breakup of the body and does not exist after death? If Yamaka, they were to, to ask you what happens to an enlightened one with the breakup of their body after death, what would you answer? And Yamaka has now got it. I would answer that the body is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering has ceased and passed away. Experience is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering has ceased and passed away. Perception is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering has ceased and passed away. Will is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering has ceased and passed away. Consciousness. Consciousnesses are impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering has ceased and passed away. Good, Yamaka, good, said Sariputta. If there is the view, the permanent essence and the body are the same, there is no living of the holy life. And, there, and if there is the view, the permanent essence is one thing, the body is another, there is no living of the holy life. Without veering towards either of these extremes, the Buddha teaches the Dharma by the middle, dependent origination and dependent cessation. One who sees dependent origination and cessation sees the Dharma. One who sees the Dharma sees dependent origination and cessation. I put this in here because this is another definition of right view. If you understand dependent origination as it truly is, then you are a stream winner. The one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. The one who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. With delusion as its cause, the will comes to be. With will as a cause, consciousness is, even the mind. With consciousness as a cause, the name and form, nama rupa, which are the objects of consciousnesses. With name and, for, name and form as a cause, the six sense bases. With the six sense bases as a cause, sensory contact. With sensory contact as its cause, experience. With experience as cause, wanting. With wanting as a cause, fuel. And the word fuel here is upadana. It literally does mean taking up as a source of continu continuity, like the fuel in your car. With fuel as a cause, these states of existence, with states of existence as a cause, rebirth, with rebirth as a cause, aging and death, sorrow, crying, pain, unhappiness and distress come to me such as the origin of this whole mass of suffering. No God, no Brahma, can be called the maker of life. Empty phenomena roll on, dependent on conditions all. The cause and effect process, no being in charge. But when a meditator has abandoned delusion and aroused true knowledge, then with the fading away of delusion and the arising of true knowledge, one does not generate a meritorious volition or demeritorious volition or neutral volition. When delusion is gone, 
that volition, the will, stops. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of delusion comes cessation of will. With the cessation of will, cessation of consciousness is that has to be in the next life. When you're enlightened, you don't become unconscious. With the cessation of consciousnesses, cessation of the objects of consciousnesses, name and form. With the cessation of name and form, cessation of the six sense bases, the cessation of the six sense bases, the sensation of sensory contact. With the cessation of sensory contact, the cessation of experience. Cessation of experience, cessation of wanting. Cessation of wanting, cessation of fuel. Cessation of fuel, the cessation of states of existence. The cessation of states of existence, cessation of rebirth. Cessation of rebirth, aging, death, sorrow, crying, pain, unhappiness and distress cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Home builder or house builder, you have now been seen, said the Buddha. You shall build no houses again. Your rafters have been broken on your gables all torn. Thrown off course, the chitter, the mind, will be destroyed right here. It's a Theragata. Without any doubt, mind, you shall be destroyed. That's all I'm going to be teaching today, apart from questions. That is the end of the right view. Or rather the end of wrong view. <laughs> okay, now questions. Arjun Brahm. Excellent Sutta class. Excellent, 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 I think. Yeah. <laughs> With view to the last one, you know, dependent origination, mm. you know, these conditions, that, this ceases, that ceases, our, our current world, you know, we are conditioned, you know, to believe on the dependent origination, not the, the ceasing. You know. yeah. It's so strong in us, you know, the medical, everything, all these things, and sometimes it's, when we try to, this, the, you know, it's so strong in us, and this Buddha teaching provides a lot of relief to us. You see yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Mm. Even many times when we talk about Paticca Sambhupada, so it's always described as dependent origination. And just to be a bit rebellious, you never have dependent origination explained by the Buddha without dependent cessation. Mm. So sometimes I just, it's not quite accurately correct to say Paticca Sambhupada means dependent cessation, but that's implied in there. Mm. So dependent cessation, how cessation happens. So you can no longer need to get reborn anymore. Mm. You're out of here. I'm destroying the membership of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think there may be some questions on the internet over there. So I think it's worthwhile because you are all very good today, and uh, we managed to get through this quite quickly. So, may I do a few questions on the internet? See how it goes here. Yong Ji An, what is the cause for the arising and cessation of the five aggregates? What do you mention that at all? Which aggregate are you talking about? You have, like, um, the body. What is the cause of the arising of the body and the cessation of the body? If you look in the Satipatthana Samyutta, sometimes people just think of Satipatthana and just you know the usual two big suttas, but they also have the Satipatthana Samyutta where they give what it means to see the arising of, let's say, the body and the ceasing of the body. It's not just seeing the body come and go, it's why it comes and why it goes. And they have like the four causes for the arising of a body. Five, sorry. And the arising and sustenance. Like the solid food is one of those causes. Is it four or five? I think it's four, isn't it? It's one is the body. One is the uh, experience. 
the, you know, the senses, the five senses, is what they say, and it's so true, if you were deaf and blind and couldn't feel anything in your body, if you had no sensory activity, the body would not survive. It needs that sensory experience to survive. It also needs will to survive. And also I think consciousness is the last one. It does need those things. So that's you know, where the body comes from, what causes it. When those things disappear, then of course the body disappears. When it comes to perception, what's the cause of perception? You can see it down here. Perception is you know, part of the sensory contact. You need to uh, have a sensory experience before perception comes. If sensory perception finishes, sensory contact finishes, experience finishes, then there's no perception. When it comes to a oh, Vedana, already there, Vedana is down there, experience is caused by sensory contact, will is caused by delusion, and consciousness is the fifth of the states of existence, that is caused by delusion. So says the Buddha here. I like it with, it was also another way the Buddha said that uh, consciousness and the objects of consciousness. So like mind, what causes mind? It's the objects of mind. He's called them the two sheaves of reeds, using a simile which everybody would have known in the time of the Buddha. And those two sheaves of reeds, just leaning against each other, if you take one away, the other one will fall down. You can't have two there at the same time. And there's a couple of monks outside, but I'm senior to both of them, so I can carry on talking. It's very good that I'm a senior monk now, because others have to respect me. <laughs> so I don't feel bad about carrying on here. Now, from New Zealand, next question. Do you believe there is still exists today, Arahats in this world? I don't believe. I know. Belief is uncertain. From Germany. How do you digest the Dhamma so it becomes flesh and blood? I think you can only understand if you can feel it, not by thinking. Are practice and stillness in meditation all to do? Yes. To get that stillness, to practice the Eightfold Path. That's why the Buddha always said, what is the cause for you know, all stages of enlightenment, for understanding deeply? The Eightfold Path, that's a path. Uh, it, it, the highest part of that path is samasamadhi, which is always one or more of the jhanas. And that's where the Buddha said, that's just the path. Now the destination, what happens? And that's where they keep on saying that when you reach that samasamadhi, that stillness is the cause for seeing things as they truly are. Yata bhuti yana dasana. And that's the cause for the enlightenment to happen. And that's the cause for the knowledge of enlightenment. Experience first, and the knowledge afterwards. Next question. The statement that everyone gets reborn in the second jhana realm when the universe is destroyed is weird. Does that mean any Tom, Dick and Harry? What about the ladies? <laughs> Get into jhana realm without meditating? Yes. The reason that's the only place where you can go. It's almost like the body. There's no ways the body can exist anymore. So the only realm you can go to is the mind. The mind is you know, freed from the body for a while. Actually for a long time. You may think it's weird. Once you understand what these jhanas are, it's not weird at all. It's just the only place where you can go. Dear Ajahn, in Sanyuta 35 it is said, what is impermanent is suffering, what is suffering is not self. Why the last part? Why being suffering implies being not self? I don't get it. 
Look, if there was really, that was a soul, a permanent essence, that's why I use that description, a permanent essence. A soul is not something which changes. You know, sometimes a soul is like an essential part of the universe. What used to be called the, a, f a fundamental particle, which you use that and everything else is built up from that. They had the idea that as atom, you know, in science, and if there's any people who know uh, ancient Greek, the word atom comes from atoma, it means non-divisible. It's a solid core particle. Non-divisible means permanent, unbreakable. You can build up other things from an atom, but you cannot split it up. And good on the Kiwis, good on Rutherford, he actually split the atom. Now I've mentioned this, atom, the Greeks and the Indians had a lot of contacts. The atom and the atma. The Buddha split the atoma <laughs> a long time before <laughs> Rutherford did. He realized that this solid thing we call the soul, the essence of each human being or whatever, even the paramatma of the Hindus could split that, which means there's nothing here. And that was an amazing thing to know that. Because the a self, a soul, an essence which always gets reborn. Sometimes people say, yeah, well, my soul gets you no know, change, but what is the uh, absolute internal, unchangeable essence of this thing you call a self? If it's all subject to change, then it can all disappear. There's no unchangeable core and essence in there. It can't be a real, what people think of as their soul. So that's actually where that comes from. Okay, now is there any other questions from the floor here? Okay, just want to say something more, okay. Ajahn Pram, regarding the speculative view, no, yeah. just before the end, you know, yeah. yeah, I'm so glad I hear this, you know, okay, yeah. that the Buddha is um, what I call not, uh, don't, don't believe in the speculative view. Yeah, I was thinking of the press, you know, the current press, you know, the news, okay, yeah. they're so full of the bullshit speculative thing, you know. Yeah. World War coming three, and they have different views, and then the other one say this, and then it's so distressing to hear all this nonsense that I and a lot of people too they don't watch the news now. This thing, you know, if they can only ref these people can ref you know understand all yeah. these things, you make the world a better place to live in. Yeah. Too much speculative nonsense going on. Yes, and please remember always be careful of news which makes you afraid. Because the fear is the usual way of controlling people. It's one of the reasons why here we never say that, don't question me, Eddie. If you keep questioning me, I will send you to hell. <laughs> That's how people control. And hopefully you understand. You can come in here and say whatever you like. And do a lot of wise stuff, but we don't have any punishments, nothing to fear, because it's not about controlling, it's about liberating. Freedom, not imprisoning. At the back. Yeah, got the ball bill. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Okay, um, uh, uh, please excuse me if the question is um, a little bit um, uh, not very um, well um, asked, okay? Yeah. Um, we don't want to come back because there's too much suffering. Then where are we going after death? And what is liberation? And what is Nibbana? And is, is Nibbana a physical place? Or is just a... what? Nibbana is a freedom. 
a cessation of all of this, including you, when there's no person to be reborn, then there's no rebirth anymore. You are just a process, cause and effect. This is why they taught dependent origination. This is describing who you are, a process which is caused delusion, which causes will, which causes consciousness and experience and craving and other states of rebirth, going round and round and round and round. But there is not a person. Suffering exists, but no sufferer. When you see that, not as a view, but as an experience, then you can vanish. And that's the end of things for you. Okay, you got a question? There's a question here from Nicholas. Nicholas over here. Okay, no, so, no, the nun is okay. senior, I'll give respect. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ajahn. Um, just checked if I understood when you talked about the vipalasa, about the right view, the perception and thoughts. Yes. So I think that that's what I use to understand what's going on, yes. you know, moment to moment and day to day. So I th heard you said view was the last one. Was yes. that right? To no, you can start anywhere. It's anywhere. Like a, it's like a vicious circle. That's what, <laughs> that's what I thought. So is there, um, you know, a very good shortcut you can tell me of how to use those three, whether it's the perception or they're changing, to maintain cultivating good and skillful uh, states of mind. Thank you. Yes, indeed. The only, the view is the first one which is clarified, and which is cleaned up. And the way that's cleaned up is you suspend all your thoughts with being silent inside, being peaceful, being still. And that you know, changes your perceptions too. You know, you can actually see things like you disappearing. It's weird. And the first time you see your body just totally vanish, wow. And afterwards, what was this? So the, the frog is now in dry land. It's the first time it can perceive the absence of the five senses. It's not a speculative view, you're actually on dry land. And that's why it's a bit weird and can be frightening. And often when a person gets into a jhana or a cloth, oh, it's a bit much for me. It's not too much for you, it's just scary because you're going to where you've never been before. Like the prisoner who's being released from jail. I just don't want to be released, I'm used to jail. It's not pleasant, but at least I know what to do. Freedom is challenging for a prisoner. This is one of the reasons why that you know, after a while those, you can't resist it. After a while you just go on to the dry land, your perception totally change. As a result of that, the view is changing. And soon that view is so changed, not by uh, speculation or just making inferences, by your direct experience. It's not like a belief in a God. It's actually experiencing cessation, which is a totally different ball game. Sometimes people ask, you know, I tell jokes. Did the Buddha ever tell jokes? Or even just this anagami called Chitta, the householder. He was a general. He went to see a Mahana, the Nigantanata Puta, otherwise known as Mahavira, the leader of the Jaina sect or religion. And the Jaina uh, leader said, oh, here comes one of the very well-known disciples of the Buddha. And he said, we've been talking about meditation. Can you stop thought? What do you think, um, Chitta? And Chitta replied, I don't believe that at all. There you are. Here's one of the chief disciples of the Buddha. 
And he says, you can't stop thinking in your mind. Thinking is natural. It's like the current in the Ganges. And think that you can stop that current just by putting your fist in the Ganges and try and stop it. It can't be done. And even Chitta says so as well. And Chitta said, I said I don't believe that. I know it. Because I get into jhanas. <laughs> and the, the leader said, oh, these Buddhists, they're very tricky and sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that when I read that, that was funny. <laughs> anyway, I thought it was anyway. He tricked Nataputa. Okay. You, oh, you had a question, Nicholas? Made this the last question, yes. What is the question? Because poor old Bill, <laughs> he must be feeling tired. Sit down on a chair, Bill. <laughs> Put your feet up, yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you'll just say it and I'll just repeat it. What is impermanent is suffering, yes. Cool. Not for the reasoning of philosophy, but you know, you may have a wonderful time over in Jhana Grove, on retreat. But you know it's going to end. And that's kind of suffering. So this is our problem here, that often that we have to understand that even in the heavenly realms, and Jhana Grove is the, maybe the closest to the heavenly realm you have here in Western Australia. <laughs> and uh, even that, because it's going to end, it kind of spoils any happiness. Okay, this story just came up the other day because a few of the monks were thinking of going on a uh, pilgrimage to India. And we were talking, somebody was talking about Emperor Ashoka. And Emperor Ashoka, he had a brother. And the brother was not interested in Dharma at all. He was just the, he was the brother of one of the, the powerful emperors. He just liked using his authority, you know, to enjoy himself, eat great food, and have great girlfriends, listen to music, whatever he wanted to do, he could do. And so he, he thought he'd have to teach his brother a lesson. So he went to take a bath. This is the emperor. And he left all his royal regalia and I saw a, a photo of that poor uh, King Charles III now. The amount of clothes he had to wear was enormous. Anyway, King Ahsoka had lots of clothes as well. He left it outside, he went to take his bath. And his brother walked past and saw all the royal regalia outside the bathhouse. And one of his friends said, why didn't you just try it on? You know, if the emperor dies, you'll have to be the emperor. You'll have to wear this. Just try it. I said, oh, I can't do that. That's illegal. That's a capital offense. But we won't say. You know, just try it on for five minutes. The emperor's in his bath. He will never find out. And of course, uh, the emperor's brother wanted to do this. So he put it all on. And just now, uh, like being the emperor. And that moment, a soaker came out. What are you doing, brother? I was only just trying it on for size. I, I wasn't trying to become the emperor or anything. I don't want to be the emperor. And Ashoka said, you know that's illegal. And being an emperor, I have to administer the law without any prejudice. You know, I've worn my clothes. That's a capital offense. I will have to execute you. He was serious. And this poor man, this brother was just so terrified. And he pleaded and pleaded for mercy. And the Ashoka said, look, you're my brother. What I will do, I'll give you one week clemency. But after one week, you'll be executed. And in that one week, you can enjoy just all of the food, you can enjoy all my wives, you can enjoy all the entertainment, whatever you want, for seven days. But after seven days, you'll be executed. And the emperor went away. And after seven days, he called in his brother. 
you know, had the executioner right next to him. He said, did you enjoy the pleasures of being an emperor for seven days? And then the brother said, how could you enjoy that when I knew I was going to be killed? I couldn't even sleep at night, let alone enjoy anything. And then Ashoka smiled and said, exactly. If you're an emperor for seven days or seventy years, it will always end in death. What is impermanent is suffering. I never was going to execute you anyway. You are free. <laughs> I just wanted to teach you the Dhamma. Thank you, thank you, brother. And that's where Ashoka's brother learns about things like Four Noble Truths. Even experiencing the pleasures of being an emperor for seven days was suffering if you knew it was going to end. Okay, I'll leave you with that story. I'm going way over time. So thank you all for listening. We can now bow three times and do the Arahang Samar Sambudo. <laughs>